Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture three where we continue our exploration of the hypsometric equation. In the previous segment we derived what the hypsometric equation actually is using the definitions of hydrostatic balance and the ideal gas law. And in this segment we'll start to explore some of the physical consequences that arise from the hypsometric equation. So just to refresh your memory, this is what the equation was that we left off with last time. And to sort of test your understanding of this equation, sort of conceptually what it might represent, I'll go ahead and pose the following question to you. Are the isobars, which are lines of constant pressure, are the isobars closer together or farther apart for a cold mean virtual temperature? So even feel free to pause the video and think about this for maybe a few seconds or a minute or two and see if you can come up with some sort of answer just using the equation as, as guidance. So one thing that we can do to sort of help us answer this question is we can rewrite the left-hand side of this equation here, z2 minus z1. We can simply rewrite that as delta z, which is just the, uh, the difference, the, the thickness between the two pressure levels. So if z2 is the height at which pressure 2 occurs and z1 is the height at pressure 1 occurs, then the distance that separates those two pressure levels can just simply be abbreviated as delta z. So just sort of as an example, if pressure 1 were 850 millibars, and that occurs at 1.5 kilometers, and pressure 2 were 700 millibars, and Z2 were at 3 kilometers, then the thickness between those two pressure levels, so the difference between those two pressure levels, would be 1.5 kilometers. Just sort of a back-of-the-envelope rough example that you could theoretically see in the atmosphere. So delta Z is just the, the uh, distance that separates the two pressure levels, P1 and P2. So let's actually take a look at uh, sort of more visual approaches to what's going on here. So let's consider uh, what happens if this value on the right-hand side is really large. So let's say the mean virtual temperature is very large. If this right-hand side of the equation is very large for a given pressure levels P1 and P2, that means the left-hand side of the equation must also be very large. So if our virtual temperature, our mean virtual temperature throughout the layer between the two pressure levels is very large, that means the distance that separates those two pressure levels must also be large. Similarly, if the value on the right-hand side, if our mean virtual temperature is very small, meaning it's relatively cold between the two pressure levels, then that means the value on the left-hand side must also be small, which means, therefore, the distance that separates those two pressure levels must also be small. So to answer the question that we had, if you have a relatively warm mean virtual temperature, that means you've also got a warm scale height, and that also means that the isobars, the lines of constant pressure, will be spaced farther apart. If you've got a relatively cold virtual temperature, again, this right-hand side of the equation, you've got a small scale height, and you also have uh, pressure levels that are closer together because delta Z is also smaller if your virtual mean virtual temperature is colder. So warm virtual temperature means that your pressure levels are going to be spaced farther apart. Cold virtual temperature or cold mean virtual temperature throughout the layer, your pressure levels will be spaced much more closely together. Now this also explains one of the things that we often see in the atmosphere. So if you've ever been in a nice, intense uh, a winter storm system, like a nice blizzard that's blowing 40, 50, 60, 70 mile per hour winds, you might be wondering why are the low pressure systems stronger in the winter than they are during the summer? And that has to do with the, f with the relationship that we derived from the hypsometric equation. You'll notice that in the cold case where we have <laughs> cold case uh, in the case where the mean virtual temperature is cold we'll see that the pressure level the isobars are closer together and you may remember from the previous lecture if you have isobars that are closer together you've got a stronger pressure gradient which therefore means you have a stronger pressure gradient force which also therefore results in a stronger wind, which we'll see a little bit later on when we derive the geostrophic wind we'll see how those two things are actually related but for now from just sort of a conceptual real-world framework that sort of explains how the colder, core t the colder core systems have a much tighter packing of the isobars, which gives you a stronger pressure gradient, which therefore gives you a stronger pressure gradient force. So that explains why the winter systems 
are so much stronger than the summer systems because in the summer systems, the, the isobars are spaced much farther apart. So that gives you a weaker pressure gradient force and a weaker uh, wind field as a result. Now, the exception to that rule comes in hurricanes, but hurricanes have a different mechanism that uh, produces the strong pressure gradient force winds that they have. So, and we'll talk about that as the course progresses. But for now, for most of the normal, quote unquote, normal weather systems that we deal with, this explains why the cold core systems, the systems that occur in the winter, tend to be much more dynamic and much stronger than the systems that occur in the summer. Now, it's also kind of important to keep in mind the two equations that we got this hypsometric equation from, which is the hydrostatic approximation. And you may remember hydrostatic approximations and is only valid if the vertical motions are negligible. So hypsometric equation also doesn't work that well if we have vertical motions that are quite strong. This is only designed to work with uh, situations where the hydrostatic balance is applicable, which therefore means that we must have negligible vertical motions in order to get any sort of meaningful results from using the hypsometric equation. And also we use the ideal gas law to arrive at this final result. So if the layer of the atmosphere that we're looking at does not have a quote unquote ideal gas, then also the hypsometric equation won't work so well for us. But in most large scale, that is synoptic scale um, cases, then the hypsometric equation actually works pretty well. In fact, it's kind of a good thing it works very well because uh, I believe this is also how uh, aircraft tune their altimeters. They use the information about the virtual temperature throughout the atmosphere and that allows them to use the pressure to determine what their altitude is. So that's gonna do it for this segment. And in the final segment of this lecture, we'll take a look at uh, sort of a mathematical example of application and arrive at another sort of uh, rule of thumb that forecasters like to use when using the hypsometric equations. So with that, I will see you all in the next segment.